Whether you're new to the show or a seasoned listener, you might have picked up that the vibe of the show is like a happy hour or a coffee date with a good friend who happens to really love nature. Well, today we are taking that fun to a whole new level. Welcome to Rewildology, the nature podcast that explores the human side of conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. I am so thrilled to welcome you to the debut episode of the show's newest series called Nature Happy Hour Chat. (laughs) Oh, just the name alone should give you an idea of what it's going to be about. (laughs) Joining me for each of these conversations is my great friend and the brilliant conservation scientist, Charles Von Rees, PhD. Charles and I have spent countless hours in the field, which has awarded us with many stunning encounters in nature. So for our very first episode in this new series, we are kicking it off with a burst of color. Charles and I go back and forth exploring some of our favorite sightings in nature and (laughs) sprinkling of some crazy stories in between. Charles and all of his science knowledge ways also shares with us why some groups of animals are bright and brilliant and beautiful and why some of us are not like mammals. You know, we're pretty much white, tan, and black (laughs) in every shade in between. But if you look at the insect world and the bird world, oh my gosh, there are so many colors that even it's beyond our spectrum of sight, which is so cool and exciting. And of course, whenever you're done listening to the episode, please reach out on any of Rewildology's social media channels, email, anything, and let us know your favorite story of colors in nature. Have you encountered a beautiful bird yourself or crazy insects or a mountainous meadow field of flowers? Anything that has moved you, I would love to hear the story. And if you have any requests for future topics that Charles and I should cover in one of these fun happy hour chats, by all means, please let me know. But without further ado, friends, grab your favorite drink. As you can see right here, I have my morning cup of coffee ready to go. Or if it's evening for you, a wine or whiskey or maybe even just a glass of tea. (laughs) Anything will do. But get nuzzled in, comfy in, and settle in for a great conversation with me and Charles. What drink do you have today? What'd you come with today? I am drinking a little bit of like f- local flavor, I guess. Um, a, a brewery called Terrapin here in Athens. I don't know if oh. they're from Athens. I think they are. We have a handful of breweries here that are. Uh, can you check out the can? Popular. Where does it say? Does it say on the can where it's from? I'm sure if I look at it for long enough. <laughs> um, but it's uh, it says Pinkerton, which sounds like a place in Georgia. It really does. Um, but it's it's a little IPA they have. I'm not one of those people. I'm not like an IPA snob. But it's an IPA that that is um, involves some flavors from Hawaii, um, mm. particularly something called Passion Orange Guava or Pog, which that sounds if you ever phenomenal. played Pogs, yeah, it's good. It's good. Did you ever play Pog, or know anyone who played Pogs in the nineties? No. You're a nineties kid. No. I mean, it, I'm a nineties kid, but I grew up under a rock. In the middle of the Appalachians. Um, okay. And I ran yeah, around that's... barefoot in dress up clothes. That was my childhood. I mean, love that. <laughs> yeah. It was a whole thing. This is a very, you know, off topic fact. But yeah, there was this whole thing, this massive fad in the 90s with little paper discs with pictures on them. And you had to throw plastic discs at them. And there was this whole game and you could like collect them and trade them. Uh, and it was just a huge thing for a little while in the 90s. And it comes from Hawaii and it comes from Passion Orange Guava. But like when I was a kid growing up around Boston, like no one knew why it was called Pog. I never got that explained to me. Then it blew my mind when I went to Hawaii and learned about it. <laughs> um, but I'm going to tie this back to our theme for today because as much as we're going to indulge in plenty of ridiculous conversation, I, I like the fact that we're applying some rules to what we're doing. And our one very generous rule today was having a theme, a couple stories with a theme, and the theme was colors. Is it safe to say colors in nature? Yeah. I mean, where else would they be? Hmm? <laughs> I mean, I would rather talk about colors in nature. There's plenty of other colors I see that I'm not nearly as impressed by, but the ones in nature <laughs> are always amazing. Um, and I, 
I understand that in true, you know, very true to form, you vastly overprepared for what was intended to be. I couldn't help myself, Charles. <laughs> I'm, I have a problem, and it's called overpreparedness. <laughs> Tell me your process. How did it start? How did the urge begin um, to prepare? Uh, the urge was I can't go into an episode and not have a list of things to possibly talk about, even though the whole point of this episode was to be off the couch. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it takes practice, maybe. So, okay, all right, I guess I should ask this question. How many... Uh, color experiences did you write out? I made myself stop at 13. Very interesting number to stop at. Okay. I Well, okay, okay, okay. I had 12, and then I thought of another one. Ah, okay. So then I had to write that, that one down. Yeah, it's a little extra. Okay, 12, 12 is good. I just had a gorgeous, I think a bluebird go by my window attacking something. I think she might have been eating the spiders outside my window that's really awesome oh that's um, super cool tis the season for yeah spiders getting smoked by various birds <laughs> yeah. um all right so i guess uh, to 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 take what is too much preparation and throw a wrench in it how about what's your number five the nu- the, the Just, okay the fifth thing yeah, i wrote down what was the fifth of okay 13? okay <laughs> one two three four five okay my peacock friend in Nepal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm curious. Okay, yeah. Well, I mean, as we all know, the male macaw is one of the most gorgeous birds. I mean, honestly, to me, one of the most gorgeous just beings in general with a big, wait, wait, the beautiful Wait, ma- the male fancy. macaw? A male peacock. Did I say macaw? Peacock. I think I so. I might have said macaw. If I did, mm-hmm. I apologize because I was just in Brazil and I saw a lot hey. of macaws. I actually have... Yeah. Um, one of the species that I saw listed out on this list, but this is the peacock. Okay. And, um, yeah. And he didn't have his full tail feathers, but I- I'm oh. assuming that this particular bird was fed by tourists a lot. And so <laughs> we were tracking a leopard on foot because that's what you do. Um, probably not the wisest thing looking back in the mm. density of tigers that I now realize was in that area. But mm. <laughs> I trusted my trackers and my guides. They were really good at what they did. And we were tracking a leopard um, and Jeez. this peacock. I know I have stories. <laughs> and this peacock was just following us the entire time as we're tracking this <laughs> leopard and trying to find it. Because we were pretty sure it had a kill because we could smell it. We could smell the kill. Um, mm. And then there was also langur monkeys that were going berserk with uh, alarm calls. But at the exact okay. same time. There was this peacock that was just following us, like it was just it was just our buddy. It was just trucking along with us, um, and it, I also love to see peacocks in their actual Asian natural environment. And that was my next question. Was not walking around area, somewhere in the United States or wherever else they're right. randomly at. Um, but yeah, so this was in Bardia National Park, and uh, I think I saw. I think I saw wild peacocks in India when I was there in 2017. I have to go back and look. I'm pretty sure I did. But this particular peacock really stood out to me because it hung out with us for quite a long time when we were leopard tracking. (laughs) Well, tell me about the colors of this peacock. Uh, Oh, my gosh. The iridescent blue, you know, like, you know, the crest and everything like that. See, my, um, my brain went straight to the tail, but you're totally right. Like, well, it, did, it wasn't in its mating body. collars, so it didn't have the big, beautiful tail. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. It didn't have one. Um, are they are they that like, I don't even know how that, you know, a lot of a lot of birds in that whatever family or order are like lek breeders and they're very polygynous and things like that. Do, do you know anything about how they what they literally do? Do they have, like, no one clue you're the bird guy. You're the bird guy, and I'm going to I'm going to rely on you and your bird okay. knowledge to tell me about to look peacock that up. breeding. I, I'm going to look that up right now. I don't. Yeah, please don't, do like, that. Peacock breeding biology. I don't. Um. Yeah, I should have looked it up. I was so distracted by the leopard and the tigers. <laughs> so you did see the leopard and the tigers. Uh, I saw five tigers on that trip. Um, oh my gosh! In the same on that, place on that, that I was tracking journey? leopards. Uh, yeah. No, not wow. the same day. The next okay. day. <laughs> okay. Okay. The, the peacock had left you alone by then. <laughs> yeah, we left it. We got back okay. in our Jeeps and, and moved on. What are you finding? 
Is it Wikipedia? Uh, What's the Google say? I have a lot of a lot of like chaff to sift through here. Googling anything on nature topics often brings up a lot of just crud. You know, I Honestly? mean, this is a big reason why I started Google in nature is like, I kind of want people yeah. to have easy access to like really scientific information on nature topics. That's also not impossible to read. And that, or, or like behind a paywall and that, that like compromise is hard to find, which is making me think that maybe I need to write more about peacocks. <laughs> uh, I just like, honestly, I just go to Wikipedia a lot of stuff anymore. I know that you're not now that I'm no longer um, in school and I could actually use Wikipedia now. Uh, mm. It is very, very, very helpful and a lot of stuff. It, it, yeah, it is. And I think the mm -hmm. quality of Wikipedia resources has only gone up. I mean, the first thing that comes up is like a Quora question and it's, is reproduction in peafowl through the tiers of peacocks? And I don't even know. What does it even mean? I don't know. <laughs> T tiers, okay, okay. tiers from the male genitalia is poured into the reproductive canal of the peahen. This sounds so bizarre. How do you even... Okay, I'm on Wildlife SOS. The breeding season of peafowl oh, okay. falls between March and September. Okay, so uh, they do have a distinct season. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing that they're polygynous, and I'm guessing that they might be like, they might display on Lex. That's very um, kind of characteristic of that group of birds, especially ones where like, you know, when you see that much ornamentation on a male, like usually that's that means like sexual selection is really strong, which means usually, what's the word for that? Oh no, there's a science word I'm forgetting. But basically like there's a, within the breeding system of certain like species, there's like sexual asymmetry where like one, if one male is, fa is fathering like 90% of the babies every time, then the selection for being super sexy is like so high. And to make something like a peacock where like their tail, you know, makes them easy to murder, like, yeah. or like super visible, right? Like for a leopard, it's like, pff, I'll just grab them by the tail. Um, where it's that extreme, usually that means that like the, what is that called? Anyway, the but that, that, that trait of like, what's that? The sexual selection or like that sexy trait that. Yeah. But specifically like the amount of babies that different males in the population have that the sexual, like whatever it is, reproductive asymmetry or something. Mm -hmm. Um, if you have strong sex, sexual selection, that's usually because, or one of the reasons it can be is because you have really strong asymmetry there. So like probably one peacock is just the man and like he, you know, it, it, he fathers the majority of the kids in his whatever territory or, or something like that. So does that's, this happen in deer as well? Species. Like, I mean, I, one of my favorite times of the year is the elk rut. And literally yeah, they just kill each other and they have harems of females and yeah. the biggest and baddest and most beautiful win. But right, that's more, right. but that's more brute strength. That really, I mean, I well, actually wonder how true. much female selection there was. I did sit down with an elk uh, researcher in Tennessee and she had some fascinating, she actually studied the reproductive just rates. Like that's what she studied was just reproduction and how cool it is. Um, and her group of animals was elk. Um, it and, would be cool to ask her what, yeah, what she knows yeah. about their evolution. Um, yeah, because that that's true. one, because that the the selecting pressures are different. Because that one yeah. is males against males, and I was assuming right. in peacocks it's more female selection. Because a female is just like, I mean, you don't see like peafowl just nuking it out, you know, like that tail is so it. annoying. I think they do a little bit. I don't. Think, oh, probably yeah. a little bit. I don't think they do, they do it as much as elk do. <laughs> right, exactly. I don't think they're they not, like die from it. They're not like, goring each other with their freaking antlers. Uh, right. You know. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I agree. They're definitely doing more like dazzling. Dazzling. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything. Everything's just about like their courtship displays, which like yeah, we get it. They have massive tails, but I'm I'd be really curious. Um, yeah, how many you know whether they're territorial right. or whether they all come together in one place anyway. So that's a, that's a blue, that's like a bluish purple that we're starting off with. It sounds like. Yeah. Very gorgeous. I like, and it's like iridescent and like, like shines, you know, Yeah. when you see yeah. it and when it hits the sun just right. And I'm sure that they're excellent at making sure that they're well lit. So they look best for the females and all that kind of stuff. I'm sure that they have that all down to a science. Um, cause why not? I mean, it's literally whether or not you reproduce, you know, if you look good. So I guess that's for everything. Um, okay, so your your point. Um, what is your caller that you want to talk about? 
<laughs> so I did not prepare, but I can think of a couple off the cuff. Um, my first thought was like when we started talking about nice and blues and purples, I was like, what is a good contrast to that? Um, and one thing that I've, that I've brought up before while nature guiding actually, um, is whenever I like, I don't know, whenever I show someone some very red color in nature, I'm always tempted to tell this story about the reddest thing that I've ever seen in the natural world. Um, which to this day is a Hawaiian bird, um, a native forest bird called the Eevee. And I think the English name for them is the Scarlet Honey Creeper. Huh. Uh, and I, I mean, f first of all, they're sort of like, so they're part of this group um, that's endemic to the Hawaiian islands and they're known as the, the Hawaiian Honey Creepers. And I'm trying to remember the name of the, of the family, Drapanidae, I think. And they're like basically some, they share a common ancestor with like house finches and some of the other like new world finches that, you know, got lost, went off course, ended up in Hawaii, and then entered this environment of this super isolated island where they like just had this evolutionary explosion and like, you know, differentiated into like every available niche. Uh, and a lot of them became adapted. A lot of the surviving species, I should say, most of them are extinct. Most of the remaining ones are, um, uh, they, they drink nectar from various flowers of trees that are dependent on them. And the EEV has this like really long, like curved mm. bill. And among, among the species of honey creepers that are still around, it's probably the most like iconic, you know, it's this like bright red, cool looking bird with this like huge, bizarre pink bill. And they just look so weird, you know, in my whole, when I started studying Hawaiian birds at the beginning of my PhD, I was like seeing these, these EEV in field guides all the time. And I was like, I cannot wait to see one, you know? Um, and I think it was maybe in 2019, I finally got to go see one. I was visiting a friend on the big island of Hawaii and um, she was a graduate student at, at UH Hilo at the time. And she and some other friends were helping out with this research project where they were uh, leaving out these recording devices in the forests of this, I think it was Hakalau National Forest, this really big, beautiful, intact forest reserve. And there's not a lot of that left in most of Hawaii, uh, that type of habitat. So we like were like seriously off-roading on this like truck, like just out in the middle of nowhere, like just out there way up in the mountains. You know, I, I don't know how many thousand feet, like eight or 9,000 feet at least, just up there. And crazy cloud forest, like, and like in the dawn of us walking out there, uh, just this like incredible dawn chorus of all these bird calls that for me were so alien, you know, as a naturalist, I was so used to, I don't know, uh, whatever it sounds like in Europe, whatever it sounds like here, it was just totally different. And there was this like weird, like reedy, like, I don't know, the, the, the Evie has this song that is just so alien to like anything that you typically hear. And I was just like, what is that? Like, that's gotta be the Evie. And of course it was. Um, and we, <laughs> I, I saw my first one, like we were like, we were collecting, you know, the, the little SIM cards from the, these uh, song recording devices. And like the sun was like just starting to come up and like illuminating the tops of the trees. And I was like looking into this tree called an ohia, which are these beautiful, um, yeah, hardwood trees uh, that are endemic to Hawaii. They might be the state, the state tree. That might be the koa tree. But they have these like these red, like poofy flowers that a lot of the honey creepers will drink from. Um, and so I just like looked up and there was this like incredibly bright red flower and then this bird drinking from it that was like 90 times more red. I mean, it was, and the sun was catching it from the sunrise and it was just, it was just the reddest thing I've ever seen in my life. And it was, it was just stunning. And I was just sitting there like with my jaw down, like, like hanging open, just watching it through my binoculars. And one of my friends was like, oh yeah, he's got an Eevee, like, just like, don't talk to him. And I was just like <laughs> losing my mind. Um, and I just remember like they asked me something and I like took the binoculars down, like looked at my friend and there was just like a blue EV like burned into my retina. Like, like my, you know what I mean? If you look at a bright light too long, like it was insane. And I just, I just don't think I've ever seen something so violently red in my whole life. Like just what an incredible bird. Um, so that's my, that's my color. <laughs> oh my gosh. That reminds me. So 
Uh, where I just was is probably a bird. It's a birder's paradise. If anybody yeah. listening is, a, I mean, you don't even have to be a birder. I became more. Lo- I'm starting to understand birding now because of my I could last not trip. believe those texts from you about <laughs> just like becoming bird curious. I was like, no way. I did not expect that. I know. I'm so mammal centric. I am. I'm just all about the predators. I just, I mean, even predatory birds. I'm just like, oh, you're so freaking cool. They're just, oh my God, they're so cool. But when I was there, the color that stuck out to me, because I've never seen anything like it before, um, was the rosette spoonbill. Wait, and where it, was there? Oh, the Pantanal. Oh my God. I didn't even say that. Brazil, yeah, the, uh, yeah, Brazil. the world's yes. most impressive wetland, like <laughs> the largest crap. wetland in the world. And it is an entire biome in Brazil. <sighs> it is Be literally a biome. Heart. It's a biome in Brazil. I'm so um, jealous. That's so cool. It, it was, it was amazing. And it's very rare. I mean, you think of flamingos, of course, you know, you mm-hmm. think of flamingos when you see that bright, uh, brilliant pink, Um, but I had never seen it on anything else really. And then these spoon bills and are, they, they, their name is perfect. They have a spoon bill and Uh just watching them. (laughs) And they were in the, uh, we were getting near the breeding season. Um, a lot of birds migrate there to breed because it's just such a, you know, it's such a plentiful area, lots of food, lots of resources. You know, birds come right. there to have their babies a lot of the time. And I did see a lot of different chick species, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, <laughs> it was just baby time. It was baby time. Aww. Lots of babies for lots of That's lots so and lots and lots of babies. Um, and yeah, and like I just saw all these spoonbills and they were in these massive flocks. But they were also very uh, skittish. And so... Mm. Getting a photo of them was actually very difficult for me, especially a bird that size. You know, they're like, I mean, what? Was that like a foot? You know, they they're, they weren't small. You know, they weren't like a little, you know, a little finch or whatever. Yeah, something. something you mean like the body, not including the legs, right? They got pretty long legs. Oh, like, I probably... include the legs because to you me, do? that's okay. all the things. <laughs> I'd give them like a yard. Like I'd give them like a few feet. Tall. Okay. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I, I don't. I have not seen nearly as many spoonbills as you have. But uh, I, I mean, I just saw a lot at one time. Um, you know how tall they are, but yeah, they were stunning. And also just watching their behavior and seeing them in, them in these big flocks, and they were also with a lot of egrets, uh, a lot of snow egrets. Uh, so it was just this massive color. But also seeing them with the snow egrets, which are pure white. So they were white, and then you had this stark pink right beside each other and you know they're just mingling like like they normally do but i have like videos and uh there's this one uh nesting colony where they were i, I don't know thousands i have i have no clue how many birds oh there were. wow okay that was my next question was like because uh-huh. a lot of time with those types of waiting birds you'll get these what we call rookeries in the business <laughs> where in these wetlands you have like some standing trees dead or not that like yeah, a lot of them were of dead. A lot of the trees were dead. Yeah. Were the egrets and spoonbills nesting together in that rookery? Mm-hmm. Dang. Yeah. Dang. That's, I'll show yeah, you. I'll sounds... show you after this. Okay. I I'll show you after it. this. Yeah, it was it was it was fantastic, and a couple birds on this trip that I was leading, uh, there were some birders on the trip. So, and our guide was also a bird specialist. So, they were <laughs> able to bring a different level of life to the Pantanal that you wouldn't have understood or, or appreciated otherwise because yeah. you know the like there's like 600 and some species of birds there and I saw like 120 130 100 and something oh something gosh. I don't know they were keeping track I was not um, yeah. but yeah. it was well <laughs> over 100 That's and insane. I probably photographed at least 50% of them at least yeah I gotta and see these wow yeah, yeah. The craziest bird I saw? Oh, my God. Okay, wait a second. Oh, I just what was it? Oh, you got your bird guide for me? <gasps> Do you see it? Aren't you so proud? Specific um, to the Pantanal? I mean, it makes sense. I'm pretty sure the Pantanal has more breeding bird species than the entirety of the North of, the, of like North America. Dude, I States. freaking believe it because um, you should have seen how much shit I saw. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure. That, uh, is, that the, is insane. The craziest bird I see. I haven't posted it yet. Um, okay. But I'm going to do a social media post that says on this bird, find this bird because you wouldn't see it. Okay. Which one? 
Oh the my Poo gosh, two. you saw wait, which I which part two one. did you see? The um, they said it was great? a greater. They said it was oh. a greater. Wow. Uh, yeah, and um, it was it was so you know it was during the day and they're nocturnal species, so yeah. we couldn't see them. So they were looking away from us and they were just like completely still, <sighs> not like you couldn't see them at all. Um, um, but that was probably because like, then I was like, what what is this bird? And then I then we looked it up and it doesn't even look real. It looks like those like no. super stupid, just AI generated animals that aren't real no no the putu is real and it is wild <laughs> they're completely nuts i have always wanted to see one or hear one for that matter like the oh yeah the smaller species the common potu they have a really cool song that sounds like bizarrely musical it's very i wonder i think i still have i i, I mean i'm assuming i'm allowed to play um i have the merlin app and I have all the Brazil stuff still on here, so I wonder. Oh, if I can, okay. I wonder if I can. Pull you might. Off you the... might. I don't know. You might have to email Cornell and be like, "Hey guys, can can I?" I don't yeah, know. that's probably. I think we did idea. that on the Nature Guys. I think whenever we use their calls, they, they're not going to say no. But I think they like, want hey, you to Hey, before ask. I publish this. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Worst yeah. case but scenario, but you can still can play just... it and then ask, and they. I don't think they're going to care. Okay, so let me do. Who do? Is well, that wait, a well, giant I... phone? Um, this is the Samsung Whoa. Uh, Galaxy Ultra. Look at the number of <laughs> I know. cameras on that thing. I know. Oh, okay. So here's the great Putu. Okay. I definitely think oh, that's a weird. Song. That's a weird call. That's creepy. That's a scary Do sound. you want song or calls? Well, yeah. That's that's not the <laughs> musical one. That's just horrifying. I would <laughs> run for my life. The, 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 great, the common Putu is the one that just sounds like a weird... Have you seen um, My Neighbor Totoro? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God, it's like it's laughing. <laughs> yeah. Well, it reminds me of like, if you've ever seen this very famous Miyazaki movie, My Neighbor Totoro, and there's a scene, like these kids are hanging out with this crazy like wilderness spirit guy, and he's very fat and he's wonderful. He's like a raccoon thing, but he plays like an ocarina basically like this little like like nut that like makes music and it sounds that bird sounds like that to me it sounds like that sound i've still never seen one i've come really close several times but because they're in costa rica and i'm in costa rica a lot more often than a normal person and i still i keep swinging missing whenever i'm trying to get a well they're impossible to see i mean like no freaking wonder like yeah, they have the perfect <laughs> camouflage and they don't move yeah. and they're nocturnal right <laughs> so <laughs> that's a very different type of color it's the you're never gonna find me color it is literally and the behavior like, yeah. right like yeah the way that they can the way that they can just they'll park themselves on a dead stick of some kind and then look like a stick and then sit there for like 12 hours <laughs> and not move like not all. moving yeah, like you yeah. Can get with their babies right too it. yeah and then it won't move yeah super super cool yeah. I cannot believe, Brooke, how ornithological this conversation has been so far. Um, I know. This is not wow. normal for me. No. <laughs> this is this is shocking. I don't know I don't know what's going on I over there. I brought up two bird species. Aren't you I so can't, proud of me? I'm I'm proud. I'm I'm confused. <laughs> I'm, yeah. It's like what is my what's happening? What are you, to my what are you drinking that has you talking about birds so much? I just in my thirties now. I think that's just what it is. Oh. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yikes i'm just yikes. getting older yep. and i'm seeing more mm -hmm. stuff and the more stuff you see i think there's a direct correlation i think the more stuff you see the more you appreciate everything and also yeah. the more stuff you see the less extraordinary things there are to see if that makes sense so like i've seen tigers i've seen leopards okay. i've seen lions i've seen elephants i've seen rhinos almost all of the rhinos i've seen like yeah so many things and so when you have so many experiences at that level, you start to appreciate everything else that there is in that ecosystem. Wow. Yeah. Well, I, I would say that that, I think that reflects very favorably on your kind of personal appreciation for things. I know a lot of people who see gorgeous stuff and then get jaded and don't appreciate anything anymore. But yeah. the fact that you're like, you know, seeing the most whatever stereotypically mind blowing and then getting just as interested in the other things 
I don't know. I think that's a very admirable quality there. I mean, you the, you do bring that up, and and you are right because I have traveled with people significantly older than me that if we weren't seeing the big stuff, then they were just, they, let's just say they were not happy. That would make me so sad. <laughs> like it as did. a guy, yeah. if I was just like, if I was like, look at this amazing spider and they were like, yeah, but like lions, I'd be like, Oh, like <laughs> you are missing out. You are yeah. denying yourself joy right now. And that's yeah, exactly awful. of appreciating what this ecosystem actually is like this whole, the, every single life part that is, I mean, except the freaking flies. I could do without TT flies. <laughs> I can do without this biting shit. Um, <laughs> you should have seen my legs when I came back. I was destroyed, but it was unseasonably hot when I was in Brazil. So oh. like, I unseasonably hot for Brazil must be terrible. Uh, yeah, it was. I was supposed to be there in the quote unquote winter time. There was nothing about over a hundred degrees. What is that like? Thirty five to forty Celsius. Yeah. Um, yeah. During the day. Ew. It was terrible. Yikes. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's brutal. Yeah. It's I hot. Mean, it was, it was just, hot. It was 85 in Georgia this week, and I was whining about it so much. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was 29 here this morning. Like, so. Are you serious? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I'm jealous. Winter I'm is really coming. jealous. It is officially mm. coming here. Good. Good. Yeah. My coworker in Colorado, she already has like seven inches of snow at her, like, I think her cabin's at like 9,000 feet or something. And I think it's spot on, you know? Yeah. yeah. We're officially in like the heart of fall now. So that makes sense. Right. Yeah. Good point. All right. So we've now what have we covered now? We've covered some browns. We've colored red. We've colored blue. Covered blue. Uh, I was trying to think of a good blue that I've seen lately. I have one. I don't know. You have one? I have one. What number is it? Um, I actually have a couple blues, but the first one I think would be really cool to talk about. Uh, okay. Wait, wait, where, where is it on your list though? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> I just can't believe we had a whole discussion about like, we're just going to wing this. And you're like, yeah, don't worry about it. I'll get my whole like list together. I know. I wrote to it the today. Max. I to the max, help Brooke. I know, it's great. I, I okay. Know. What number is this one? It's number seven. Number seven. Here we go. And it's a mammal. Oh, good transition. Okay. It is the blue monkey. I saw them in Tanzania at Lake Manyara National Park. Uh, I'm sorry. What? Yeah, Google it. <laughs> I am right now. <laughs> yeah. Blue, like, if I say blue monkey, is it going to come up with something weird? Yes. Is this also like a sex no. act or something? Or is no. This, no. Okay. Oh, no, that I, is a blue monkey. It's blue. Oh, come on. This has to be somewhat photoshopped. This is crazy. No. I can what? show you my really crappy. Okay, that there are some like hardcore. There Photoshop. are definitely some Photoshop. Okay. Like, saturated the shit out of that. But but still, yeah, it's um, someone someone just photoshopped a uh, orangutan and made it. Yeah, but if you go to blue, Wikipedia, that's... like you could see it. And what? Um, Where was this in Tanzania? Yeah, I was in Tanzania. So and it was oh. Lake Manyara, and they were Whoa. up in like the woodland area and this like dense woodland area that's surrounding. Um, so it's like it's like closer to the crater area. So it's like surrounding this big massive lake manyara um and we were driving what? through in our safari vehicle and it was over this little creek and we heard all of this rustling and then we looked up and they're like oh it's a blue monkey her guys like it's a blue monkey um and it's why actually, are they blue when i was there in 2019 that so actually this sighting was a little while ago oh but it's gosh. so rare to have any sort of species that that's a mammal that is not the normal colors so, right. um, actually, I don't know what makes them blue. Um, I'm trying to find not, that right now. And they're not like, like, you know, no, peacock yeah, they're not blue, like iridescent, but or something, they're but definitely they're... blue. Like there's this, uh, okay. I wonder why. Yeah. There's a, there's a, a bluish, um, cast to them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I, I, I wanted a chance to talk about them because, it, like I said, it's so rare to have anything that's any remotely close to another collar that's a mammal. So mm. I was like, okay, yeah, they, it was really cool when we saw them, like a blue monkey, you know? Um, but yeah, it's like the most generic name of all time. So like, <laughs> it's it's to the real? point, though, isn't it? It yeah. really is like, uh -huh. it gets you where you need to go. Oh, it's a monkey. I it's mean, it's, we're not talking like mandrel blue or, you know, some other bright, vibrant 
blue and pink and all this kind of stuff. Like very, very few mammals have. Do you got to do you have to yeah. look at mandrel? <laughs> and that's like their skin, right? I think I, I remember seeing a mandrel at the zoo as a kid, mm-hmm. but isn't that their skin? Oh my gosh. Yeah, how do they do that? That is wild. Is it only the males that have that blue on the face? Um, I think so. I think the females though, I think their reproductive parts when they're swollen. Oh, get okay. Very yeah. um <laughs> Like that's how that's how I think of one of the ways that uh okay. Yeah. Apes yeah, tend to yeah. have pretty gnarly genitalia. reproductive yeah, yeah. flashy. I mean, I'm not genitalia. trying to get too gruesome here, but yeah. Also, oh, I did not know how endemic mandrills were. Like I'm looking at a distribution map and it's like just one corner of like West Africa. Yeah, it's really hard that is to see nuts. them. Wow. What countries is that? I can't Whoa. Um, mandrills distribution. Let's look that up. Oh, yeah. They've got a a male mandrill with an extremely blue butt on Wikipedia. Wow. <laughs> oh, is, okay. Uh, so it's up in the... It's up in it's West in a little, Africa. little corner so, there. Yeah. Okay. So part of the Congo. The, the little place where Brazil used to fit before the continents did their whole Yeah. Shebang. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. It's it's a rainforest. Um. So I'm assuming that's part of the Congo rainforest. That's where you'd find them. Okay. Um, Jeez. But yeah, I mean, so I've not seen a mandrel yet. I've not been to that part of Africa. I've been south and east, but not west and north. Got it. So I've not had the chance to see a mandrel in the wild yet. But that would be awesome. And they're and they oh. are big. Holy crap! Those are not small animals either. That's I was going to ask if. That seems like a pretty. It looks also like there's a lot of sexual dimorphism there. Like a, there's a oh, picture yeah, of a male. Oh yeah, they're bigger. Like the alpha males are huge. Um, yes, yeah, so there's sexual dimorphism in a lot of ways. The males are way bigger. They're way more vibrant. Uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I wonder. Wait, how big is a how big is a male mandrill here? I have no clue. Uh, I would guess are they at baboons least, what, like technically? Is that? A, uh, huh, yeah, I, I mean, oh, how, here we go. Um, what are they? females do, 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 do males, uh, 37 inches of body yeah. length, 42 uh, to 30 kilograms. Pounds. So 66 pounds, females up to 33 pounds. So that's double mm-hmm. the weight of a female. That's pretty wild. That's huge. That That is a massive yeah. difference. I mean, you know, like pe- people aren't too far off from that. Like they're definitely, you know, yeah. there, there are some, mm-hmm. <laughs> there are some men who, who weigh twice as much as the average woman anyway, but yeah, but I guess we have we have a lot more variation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just within people, within people in general. But like, I don't know. Maybe it's because I do MMA. But like, I know lots of dudes who are like two fifty, and it's just like, you know, I, I I'm used to being one of the smaller guys around. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, no, same. I like bigger guys. That's just kind of my thing. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's just my taste. <laughs> I don't know. I like big guys. I'm just like oh. you and the mandrills. It's great. It's yeah. Great. <laughs> I am the mandrel lady of the human uh, species. <laughs> I mean, I don't think you're alone. I don't think you're I alone think in so that. Either. I think but it's a type, you know. It's yeah, people, a type. people have a type. I like and that's, muscles. That's good. So. We should all have our types. That's, mm-hmm. that's very important. Um, all right. This, this whole conversation got me thinking about a blue. Okay. Um, and maybe I'm just being... Horrible Charles and thinking about taxonomic diversity too much, but I thought of an insect um, that I like that's very blue. Uh, it's called the long-tailed skipper. Well, I got to Google that. Tell me all about the <laughs> long-tailed skipper while you... Yeah. Um, I would describe their coloration as being a can of Sprite from the 1990s. Huh, right? that is pretty you freaking get that spot fade on. fade from green to blue with some beautiful turquoises in between. It's like an old can of Sprite. I don't, maybe, maybe Sprite still does that. I don't know. I don't, are they in, no offense to Sprite. I just don't drink a lot of Sprite Costa nowadays. Rica? Where did you see them? They're native to here. They're native to like oh. Eastern US. I actually don't, I'd have to grab my book. I don't know how far North they get. Um, oh. But I, I bought my first butterfly guide back in mm-hmm. 2012, like a total nerd and spent all this time flipping through it. And there were like three or four butterfly species in there that I was like, I really want to see that someday. You know what I mean? I was just like, oh, you know what I mean? Like, like sometimes, especially if you're a naturalist or any kind of nature nerd, when you flip through a field guide, 
it's a little bit like shopping. There's a bit of like, yeah. I want to see that. I want to see that. Like the JC like, Penney's catalog when we were kids at Christmas yeah, time. <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly. You're like circling that one. Like, yes. oh, I Going hope I get that one this year. On the page corner, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. A hundred percent. And I, I was like very, like back in 2012 was very nerdily doing that. And, and, and like the one that was dazzling me the most was the long tailed skipper. So it's part of this family called the skippers. They are very small butterflies, typically very small. Um, and they're very fluttery, which is probably how they get their name. You don't see them like flying through the air. You see them like hopping between like locations usually. They're, they're not like soaring butterflies. They're very flappy. The family, the scientific name for the family is the Hesperidae. They're really neat. A lot of them, like the babies will eat grasses. So they'll turn up in weird places, but they're very cool. I had never seen a long-tailed skipper, um, but I remember seeing on some range map that like maybe there were a lot more of them in the South. And like I was up in Massachusetts, which is just like, New England is a tiny bit too far North for like a lot of stuff in North America. Like we... The species diversity for lots of things like really drops off around like, like between DC and New York, a lot of things just stop going that far north. I don't know why, but that was just, that's just a well. Thing. The Appalachians so, start stop, stop. Um, I mean, not I what I, not too far away from there. Like in general, yeah, like, I think I so. That's and, why. Maybe yeah, the, and like maybe the latitude is high enough where it just has to get too cold. I think that's part of it, and then you know we have the issue of like how far the glaciation went down. Hmm. I don't think the glaciers went that much further than I'm going to make an idiot of myself. Maybe like Pennsylvania. Like, I don't think they got that far South of the tri-state area, the glaciers. Mm -hmm. And that like pushed a lot of, you know, species diversity out that, that like drove a lot of species extinct temporarily. And then they retracted. And then like, like species have had to like recolonize right since mm -hmm. then. That's why. So anyway, so there's a whole there's a whole rant I could go on about that type of biogeography. But like, point being, I I think that's one of the drivers is that we don't have a lot of plants that a lot of like cool butterflies eat um, up in New England. But then yeah, you're totally right. Like the cold is just that's going to be a limitation. Um, but I moved to Georgia a couple of years ago, and part of me was like, wait a minute, like I bet I could see a long tailed skipper. Uh, and I went to visit the city of Savannah. Um, on the coast of Georgia with a friend of mine from Florida because it's like halfway between. So we we're like, oh my gosh, we can meet up there. It'll be so nice. Indeed, it was very nice. Savannah is beautiful. If you haven't gone, you got to check it out. What a neat city. Um, but uh, I remember reading an, an account from John Muir because he kind of like walked through the whole deep south. Um, and like, you know, as a naturalist, he described all this beautiful stuff. And before I moved to the south, I read this account from John Muir um, because, I mean, I think his writing is beautiful, and I wanted to learn more about the South. And he, you know, he he's not from there, so he had this, like a very outsider's perspective on the culture and the natural history of the South. And so he wrote this beautiful stuff about it. But he had this one period of time in his crazy journey walking across the South where he ran out of money, and he, because he would usually like just like I guess you could do this in the eighteen hundreds if you were like a white man, but he would just show up at people's houses and be like, "Can I just give you two bucks and I'll stay here for a while?" And they'd be like, "Yeah, sure." And they just like <laughs> give him dinner and breakfast and stuff. It's just crazy. Um, I, you know, you could do that nowadays, but uh, he did. And eventually, he ran out of money, and so he got stuck in Savannah. And he, his brother was wiring him some money, or I guess you're not wiring in those days. He was like <laughs> mailing him some money, and. Um, <laughs> And it wasn't coming in time. So he had to wait like weeks. And so he just started like camping, but like he didn't have a tent. So he would just like sleep outside. And luckily it's the South. So he spent a couple of weeks sleeping in this, in the woods of this like cemetery, this like old cemetery around Savannah. That's like, he was describing how beautiful the nature around it was and whatever. So when I went to Savannah, I was like, wait a minute, like people don't usually destroy graveyards, especially if there's like rich white people buried there, they'll preserve them. So I was like, I bet that place is is pretty much like he described it. So I really want to go. And so I went on a map and I found it and I went to go visit there with my friend. And it, first of all, it was beautiful. It was so cool. But we just walked around this cemetery um, and I was just admiring all the pretty trees and like just thinking about how he had described it. And then like in the middle of all of that, like just messing about and like taking pictures of the beautiful views of the, of the ocean and stuff from the coast, like a long-tailed skipper just Aww. 
like flies in front of me between one flower and another. And I lost it. And I just started screaming <laughs> and yelling and just like, I was just in paroxysms of joy and all these other people, these civilized, normal people at the cemetery were like, uh Oh, someone's having an episode, you know? Um, <laughs> But I got some pictures of it. And I think there's actually, a, like, I was taking a video of it, trying to, like, record the thing. But you can also hear me just, like, freaking out in the background. It's just it's a whole thing. Um, but just, yeah, you, you know, you've seen the picture now. It's a beautiful butterfly. It's this tiny, interesting thing. Most of the other butterflies in that family are, like, orange or brown or black. Like, they're not very attractive. And this thing is a can of Sprite, is it not? It's it's green and blue and turquoise and just, oh, like, they're so pretty. Um and now I just keep seeing them all over the place. Like now I've seen them on the UGA campus and I'm just like, oh, like, <laughs> hey man, like good to see you, you know? But uh, anyway, they're delightful. That's my, um, that's my blue. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, speaking of the, you know, back to the mandrel conversation, I'm like, ooh, they thick. They're thick butterflies. <laughs> they're not like dainty little, I mean. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're tiny, they but you're totally off. right. Yeah, for their size, they're like relative to how big they are as butterflies because they're smaller than most other species, but they are like like beefy. Like they yeah. don't have these like long, elegant wings. They're kind of like, yeah, they're solid. I, I yeah, like them. they are. I'm just like, huh, you, you got you got some oomph to you. Like if you a picture <laughs> of them, you know, like. <laughs> I wonder, I think males and females look the same too. I think they're both like that. Long-tailed skipper. I don't think there's any difference, really. Yeah, no, they look the same to me. What a gorgeous color, though. Especially now that I'm seeing pictures again, I'm just like, oh, like what a stunning <laughs> animal. <laughs> I'm sorry, like invertebrates do not get the love they deserve. Oh my gosh, these pictures are so good. Thank you, Hugh Christie, whoever took these pictures. Oh, so good. <laughs> what, what an incredible <laughs> insect. Oh. Anyway, all right. Do you have a yellow on your list? Do I have a yellow? Yeah. Um, if not, I do. then I want to hear about number two. I do, actually. Okay. And it is not an animal. Wow. Brooke. Look it's at you go. Okay. All I right. know. Yeah. So it is number four on my list. Oh, I was so close. Okay. And actually, you were. The the other, uh, number two, I actually thought about talking about next, but you gave me that wonderful prompt. I mean, we'll yellow. have to, yeah. And I have two yellows, actually. But this this one... I think if if someone hasn't experienced this yet, you have to put it on your list. And it is yellow aspen in the fall. It is one of the most gorgeous. I it's yeah. It's hard to describe the yellow that the trees turn, and specifically in September, at least in the Rocky Mountains in Colorado, where yeah. I lived. You're spot on. And yeah. it is it is unbelievable. And especially when you're walking through these forests and you're hiking and you're smelling the smells as all these leaves are starting to fall and decompose and everything. And it was one of my favorite, my favorite times of year, my favorite smells. I, I'm like, I'm closing my eyes, envisioning myself walking through an aspen grove when it is yellow. And it is, I mean, you were in Montana, you know, it was, it's, it's, Oh, I, I don't know, especially if somebody hasn't been through a forest that changes like that with the seasons. Yeah, it's unbelievable. And I was lucky the last year that I was in Colorado, I was on um, more the western side. So I was actually in the heart of the Rockies and I lived outside of these big lakes. And so there was a lot more um, fog and stuff. And so I have these stunning hmm. photos, some of my photos, like favorite landscape photos I've ever taken of these dark green evergreens in the Rocky Mountains with these bright, bright yellow aspen just in this layer of dense fog around the mountains. And yeah. I just, oh I'm, my God. I'm hearing like a Bob Ross painting right now. Yes. This sounds like yes. perfectly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly what wow. you're thinking of. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I mean, even when you're driving through the mountains at the time of year, you can just see because all these aspirins really are in groves. They're not like individual trees. They're in these groupings. And so you just have this bright flash of yellow. And then where I was, um, the elevation was around 8,800. And no the mountains deal. surrounding were up to 13,000. So 
we watched we watched the Aspen change color like through the month of September into October. Up, oh wow! At the elevation gradient, yeah, yeah, yeah. the elevation time machine, as uh-huh. I call it. Yeah, yeah. Oh. yes, absolutely. That's absolutely. Oh my gosh. Yes, and then also going up to like Trail Ridge Road because I lived right outside of Rocky Mountain National Park, and so then you could go up to there and see the like the the highest ones, um, you know, up until the point where Aspen can't grow anymore. But hmm. you could get to some of these vista points with the views where you could see entire valleys, and just all of this sprinkled beautiful bright yellow aspen groves and this deep green pine evergreen and it's just and then also the rocky mountains themselves they are very rocky they are aptly named (laughs) they are correctly (laughs) named the rockies um and then this like the the contrast of the almost like a pastel lichen that are on all of the rockies they're not it's not a vibrant color it's a very dull pastel is what i I know call the the rockies there so to have this and then also i've become quite a photographer so to have this bright yellow aspen on these misty moody foggy days just like oh like yeah i'm telling you it's bob ross that's mm, just gorgeous it's gorgeous gorgeous so yes question Mm -hmm. were there larches as well larches yeah tamarack no I, the look I'm getting right now. I, <laughs> <laughs> well, so so uh, in that, that in that part of the country, um, you know, there's a fairly abundant uh, conifer. Uh, oh, you know, okay. You know what I mean? I feel like my <laughs> botany mentors are going to get mad at me because I'm trying to remember the the, the genus. I think it's uh, is it Larix? Oh no! Hold on, Larix. Is that I don't it? Is know. That it? Nope, that's not it. Uh oh. Wait, lyrics. I was tracking Larch. animals every day and smelling the pine. I was not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I respect. It. Yeah, larches. Uh, so, so this is what's so cool about larches. They're conifers, right? So they're in the uh-huh. pine family. They got needles, all that good stuff, but they're deciduous. They sh- they turn colors and they shed their needles every year. What? Okay. I Larch? know. And if you're used to like spruces and firs, then you're like, oh my god, it's dead. But they're fine. But they they turn bright yellow and they shed oh, all yeah. of their needles. Oh yeah, I've definitely seen. I'm those. sure you saw those. Oh, I saw lots yeah, of these. I was gonna say like those would add so much to that like yellowy color pattern mm-hmm. palette. Like when I was in Montana, the larches, it kind of varied year to year. Like some years they were very synchronous and very colorful, and some years they weren't. But like my gosh, like when they went off, it was always just I mean so golden and so mm-hmm. nice. Yeah, I don't know. I, I suspect yeah, those might have been part of that. Yeah. Painting. And my next thing is a blend of both. both. Can I can I can I request a, a bathroom pause real quick and then come yes. back? Yes. <laughs> okay. Because we're doing great. We're on a fucking roll. Like I just feel yeah. like this is going so I, I am I just think this is going to like insanely well. This is such yes. a good conversation. Go, go, okay. Go, go, go. So sorry. Otherwise I'm just gonna sit here squirming for the next like yeah. 20 minutes until I pee myself. Okay, I'll be right back. <laughs> Great. All right. Uh, and we're back. Yeah, what are you Charles drinking P on? Break. Right? <laughs> it's like, and we're back from Charles P. Break. All right. I know. Mine's almost gone. I have a bladder of steel. Um, I feel like when you spend a ton of time in the field, mm-hmm. you lose your ability to hold it well. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's been the exact opposite for me. Oh, because I I've spent so much time in the field. You got to hold that fair. shit. You're right. Was, That's not fair. Dude, That's not dude, fair. Dude, when did I say this? I think I, I, I don't know if I've recently said this on the show, but I'm so excited that I've now peed in the bush on four continents. In the bush? <laughs> yeah. That's very Australian of you, I must say. That is, that is, wow. Oh, you haven't been to Africa yet, so okay, okay, okay. That's true. Okay, that's true. Okay, it's I very southern in hemisphere. the wilderness. The wilderness, yeah. Now, on, Go- four on continents. how many continents? Four? four. Yeah, you got me beat. Definitely. Well, maybe. Wait, does Central America count as a different continent? No. Dang. Yeah, you got me. (laughs) (laughs) If that's the case, then I got five. Then you got, yeah, okay. All right, all right. Okay. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, never mind. No, I've got four. Never mind. I forgot. I forgot Australia. Like Oceania is a, I mean, Australia itself is is a continent. So yeah, okay, cool, cool. Okay, okay. The same seas, but different. Same seas, but different. Yes. 
I the way that we do it is different. I oh, think no, that you are con it. Well, I mean, yeah. oh, <laughs> well, no, I just mean that you deserve more credit because I think the way that you, the way that you pee in the bush is way more difficult. Um, yeah, it's a whole production and, and risky. Yeah, I don't, mm-hmm. you know, I don't, I don't envy that. I recognize my privilege in that respect. Um, eh, I recognize it, it enough. I, for example, I once got a life bird while peeing. That's that's a real thing that happened. <laughs> Um, you know, I can't because, say about that. <laughs> you know, I was like looking around and was in a beautiful place. And here's the thing is I actually think that you will more often, regardless of what kind of equipment you're dealing with, uh, when you go to pee in the field, I think you will often see more cool stuff because you're being quiet. You're usually not like yelling or singing or running around while you're peeing and you're usually like a little tiny bit off the beaten path because you're trying to get away from people. You know who else is trying to get away from people? Wildlife. And so like, (laughs) I think, I don't know. I I always end up spotting something neat when I have to, you know, when nature calls, as it were, I usually end up seeing a lot of cool nature. Uh, Just an observation. I'm usually like making sure I don't pee on my shoes. um, Yeah, yeah, totally. Or I'm holding on to something and I'm, I've had this time. Oh my god, I had this hilarious time uh, where things did not go okay oh, uh, no. in the bush as a, in the bush pee. Um, where oh no, <laughs> a bush wee. That's apparently that's what they call it on the show Bluey. That like children's oh. show. They call it a bush wee. I learned oh. that recently. Oh, I did not know that. I don't have kids. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was hiking. Oh well, I probably I think I still have pictures of this. I was hiking in the Rockies like I did every single weekend when I was out there. And I'm almost so jealous. and almost uh pretty much before or after you would always have to pee, of course. Because my hikes yeah. were at least an hour, an hour and a half away. Or you would just go hike for, you know, five, six miles and yeah. when you time to get back, you need to go. I mean, good for you being a well hydrated person. That's yeah. I really admire that. Yeah, you would get migraines otherwise. And so I was I found this nice spot and I I found one of the one of the easiest things to do, especially in the mountains when you're a girl and you need to pee, is you find a tree on a hill and you uh-huh. hold the tree and then your butt's totally. going down the hill. That's Perfect. great. Yeah, Perfect. much better than you don't, uphill. You yes. don't you yes. don't pee on your shoes, you mm-hmm. don't like splatter all over the things. Well, right. This particular branch that I chose snaps. Oh, no, 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 no. no. <gasps> and I then went, f- I fell down like the side oh. of this hill, mountain thing, almost oh. into a creek. And I landed in another tree and I scraped my ass up like oh. all the way across my cheeks. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you got the cross cheek scrape? But that is. Yeah, not, not, not. Oh. From- it was like all the way out of my left butt cheek, like all the way, the entire <laughs> way, like all the left butt cheek, uh, the whole thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm suffering just hearing this. Uh, I think I have pictures of that. Yikes. I was like, this is hysterical. Like I put on a bathing suit and like took a picture because like you could see the scratches from outside <laughs> of my <laughs> <laughs> oh, you poor uh, thing. Oh, it's okay. It's fine. It's a Oof. good story now. Because, I mean, it's, I didn't break anything, and nobody saw my naked ass rolling down a hill, so we're good. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you broke your dignity. I would be yeah. so... Uh, oh, my God, oh. yeah. I went back to Man. my uh, ex, and I just was laughing hysterically. And then, like, I got to the car, and I pulled out my pants, and I showed him, like, of the course aftermath. You did. And he's just like, oh, my God, what happened to you? <laughs> Were you like bleeding through your pants at that point? Like, uh, I, no, oh. luckily, luckily it didn't go too deep, but it was almost like a cat scratch, like a really deep cat scratch, oh, you know, man. like, but just like, like the whole thing. Um, I'm so sorry. That is oh, it's fine. It was a good, good times. Good times. Uh, <laughs> Woof. Yeah. Can I tell you my blue and yellow? Yeah. To bring, to bring the colors back together. Guess this what? is blue and yellow as one. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's another bird. Can you believe this? Man, one? actually, I sort of can. I'm going to save this rant for later, but there is a reason why I'm not like mind blown that we're coming up with birds so much. Well, I mean, what else is that colorful? Birds and insects. and flowers. Right. And like the reason why is what I'm pondering right now. But anyway, please. Okay. You can please. explain the reason why later. I would love to hear. Oh, yeah. Um, I, yeah I definitely don't want to do it now. No. 
<laughs> um, but it is the thing that I brought up on accident earlier, and it's the hyacinth macaw. The beautiful, oh. bright blue macaw with those bright yellow eyes. And um, look, I mean, luckily they're no longer endangered. Oh, here. That was my first question that I was trying to remember if, because a lot of macaws are endangered, right? Like most of them. Yeah, yeah. This one, it was a really fantastic conservation story that I learned Gosh, when I was in the Pantanal, but uh, they are very specific uh, nesters and they nest in like one or two species of trees. And that species of tree was um, also uh, like a great wood to produce products out of. I don't remember if it was oh. like a hardwood or whatever it was. So it was high in demand. It was being cut down a lot. And so is it the Manduvi the tree? Uh, I don't know. Maybe. I heard a lot okay. of stuff in Brazilian and Portuguese that I don't I don't exactly know how they translated. Of course, um, yeah. Because like a lot of the stuff was in both languages. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, and there was this amazing, I guess this one woman started it. She recognized what was going on and she started to build nest boxes made out of this type of wood or near these trees that they loved. And she mm. alone and then like started this big project around it brought back the hyacinth macaw. Like... The whole reason why I was able to see multiple monogamous pairs when I was in the Pantanal was because of her work, like, however many decades ago. She she Yikes. brought them back. Yeah, wow. but it's like a conservation win. It's like a good, it's a feel-good story when with the Hyacinth McCall. Um, and God, and they're beautiful, and they're big. They are a big McCall. That was my I next know, question. It looks like a unit of a bird. Um, I don't know if they're the biggest one. I mean, if they're not the biggest McCall, they have to be one of the biggest, honestly. Like, yeah, um, I think they were the biggest in Brazil, but I don't know because again, oh, a birder, a meter yeah, long. Many. Yeah, they're huge. To three pounds in weight, like for a bird, mm. three pounds is extraordinarily heavy. Like birds have hollow bones, like they're mm -hmm. so light. Three pounds. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So this like page like shows like the um. Yeah, like it looks like the biggest size. one on the page anyway. Yeah. What's the other one? What's the other one with the with all the yellow on its belly and front? Oh, uh, that is the um, blue and yellow macaw. Oh well. I also well then. saw them. I saw them. I saw rescued ones. So they were semi wild. Like they were definitely wild. They were rescued and re rehabilitated on uh -huh. uh, the Vizenda San Francisco that I was on in the Southern Pantanal. Um, okay. And so I got some pictures with them, and so they would set out some food for the rescued Jeez. birds that would come back in the evening times so um it wasn't the same as like beta birds because they actually do amazing rescue and rehabilitation at this place so um i didn't mind but i got some pictures of them but yeah that's but the hyacinths cool. were wild i only saw yeah wild and that, that's an endangered species it looks like whereas the blue and yellow mm -hmm. is maybe a bit more widespread yeah yeah, huh. yeah yeah they have a much bigger range um but yeah, like the perfect blend of blue and yellow, right? Like the hyacinth to bring their, our blue conversation and our yellow conversation into one animal. Well, and, and what a blue too. I mean, it's such a- What a blue. It's such like a Like one deep, of those beautiful blues. Color. Like that rich navy. Mm, I think I, so I went to a wedding recently yeah. and I'm pretty sure the dress I wore was this color. <laughs> I was gonna say like that, that's that's I don't I don't wear a lot of colorful clothes. I feel like my personality does the work for me. But like I would wear, I would wear, I would wear a very deep blue. Sh I would wear a hyacinth macaw colored shirt. One hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, that look good on you. That's mm -hmm. that's nice. That's really mm -hmm. nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or a suit. That would look good. Mm -hmm. I don't. That's I think true. People would I only be a have thrown gray off suits. by the yellow though. They might be like, "What are you doing?" Oh, if you had like are yellow you like fan? accents like, on or something. Yeah, I think people are used to my strangeness enough. Are you just are you just aggressively drinking water right now, or is there something interesting? This in is that? not water. It is almost gone. That. It was gin and. Uh, oh snap! Okay, wow. Jeez. No, 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 this whole thing wasn't gin. It was um, I, I, gin and. <laughs> no. I would not. I didn't be mean that judgmentally. Still. Um. Yeah. Well, this entire thing was no, and I just kept it really light and simple. Uh, uh with a grapefruit zevia. The like non sweetened sodas, like they don't have mm. sugar, they're sweetened with stevia and so zevia. Cool, I see. <laughs> okay, very good branding, very yeah. original. Yeah, I was gonna um, do more of a fall drink, but I don't have all the ingredients here. So, our next well. one, I'll prepare. I'll like have like a whole 
themed cocktail. You know what oh we should have done? We should have done. If this was the caller episode. We should have done like that Empress Gin that's like purple or blue or something. And yeah, we should have. You are, we you're blowing my mind right now. I don't. I I mean, we can do that next time. By the way, hmm. I feel like we talked about something earlier that I felt would really make a great next one. Oh, okay. I'm trying to remember now. <laughs> oh no, I might have to just listen to this episode when it comes out, and then I'll give <laughs> yeah. us the next one. Oh. Do you have another color? Another color? Um, I'm sure I could come up with one. <laughs> <laughs> I. <laughs> hmm. I don't want to think about well, I I I I might go briefly on a bit of a bird rant here. Not too deep. But we've already talked about birds this on this episode. Mm-hmm. And I feel like we might a want lot to of birds. Mostly discuss birds, actually. Uh, that's what I'm saying. There's been a lot of bird <laughs> stuff going on. Uh yeah, and I felt it might be necessary or interesting to talk a little bit about like why why is it when you talk about colors, do birds come up so darn much? Um, and this is pretty interesting in my mind. So I, I learned about this when I first took an ornithology class in college back in, I must have been 2009 or something like that. Um, that like, yes, we are mammals, but we are primates. And primates are really weird in that we are so visual and our sense of smell, just to be realistic, our sense of smell sucks. You know, you and I work with Canine Conservationists, a fantastic nonprofit uh, that takes advantage of the literally superhuman smelling abilities of dogs. Um, We can't come close. Uh, Most other mammals exist in a world of smells. And part of that is why mammals don't look any interesting colors because a lot of them are colorblind, right? Like, I think you explained that to me about the deer uh, in our our Nature Guys episode that we did together. With tigers, Um, yeah. Yeah, like mammals just don't do a lot of color. You know, most mammals don't see a lot of color. Uh, Even more mammals don't produce a lot of color. Uh, Mandrill asses accepted. But but primates really do. Primates see a lot of color, probably because we used to eat a lot of fruit, I imagine, something like that. Um, But the other animal that like overlaps extraordinarily strongly with us in in what we, what scientists would call it sensory space, the, you know, the, wavelengths it can see or hear or smell or whatever uh in terms of um yeah what what things it can perceive birds and primates have a really strong overlap and so like part of the reason we find birds so beautiful is because we can hear the things that birds hear and we can see the things that birds see because those birds are not making those colors for us right they're making them for the males and females and whoever else they're trying to impress um and lots of flowers are making those colors for the bees or the birds or someone else they're trying to impress. Um, but because we're primates and we happen to be sensitive on those same spectra, it really appeals to us. And so anyway, so that, that's part of the reason why a lot of people find birds so impressive is like, yeah, they're the, the, the kind of mediums in which they show off their stuff, right, is like how we tend to see. So it's super appealing to us. And I think if we were much more nosmic animals like like pigs or dogs we might not be nearly as impressed by birds <laughs> right but like yeah we'd be thinking about what kind of smells we've run into in nature maybe that's a good episode just smells but that could get pretty gross pretty fast but anyway that's my bird rant i hope that made some kind of sense yeah it did so we are just uh bene- beneficiaries of the beauty that has evolved in birds and I mean, unfortunately, insects are creepy to most people, but insects are also very <laughs> beautiful. Um, uh, some, like yeah. a lot of them. Um, mm-hmm. If you get to, if you actually look at them, a lot of them are very colorful. But yeah, birds too. I mean, just like even like a random thing <laughs> that was not descriptive at all, but just like you know, and like Where the open prairies or just. Just common birds, like everywhere. There's cardinals everywhere around here. Like that is a vibrant red bird. How many vibrant red yeah. things are there? And we just don't even think about it. Or the bluebird that like you just thought you saw outside of your window, or um, like the cellar jay that I would see all the time when I go to Rocky Mountain National Park, or even the magpies that had like this flirt, like this iridescent blue and their black tail feathers and stuff. It's like we don't oh, have yeah. any of that. 
We're like, <laughs> we're like tan, brown, and black. Like that's yeah, like that's like the colors that we can generate. And from what I just understand, mammal stuff. I have I have bright blue eyes, but from what I understand, and maybe you can tell me if I'm wrong, or we have to look, Google this. I'm pretty sure that my eyes are from a lack of color, not yeah. Not from like I'm not generating my blue eyes from what I understand. Right. It's the exact right. opposite. I just lack color in my eyes, and so they mm-hmm. appear blue, right? From yeah, I mean you're you're more of the mammal expert, but like if I'm not mistaken, a lot of a lot of like predatory species as babies have blue eyes until their mm-hmm. irises melanize. Basically, they have to produce melanin to turn brown. Um, yeah, I, I have blue eyes too. I imagine a very different shade from the looks of it. But, um, you know, one of the things that you probably notice as a blue eyed person that I did not realize was weird until I was older was like, you're really light sensitive. So when, the, light when sensitive. there's like a lot of glare Dude. from the sun, you're like, ah, like as a little kid, I can remember I get like migraines. at recess, just like knopping a little of my eyes sometimes when it was bright out in the winter. And like, that's because like the reason brown eyes are a thing is because it protects you from all that extra sun and when you happen to be you know genetically unable to produce the melanin in your eyes they're blue and then you can't absorb that extra light and so it's like glare you become really sensitive to it Mm -hmm. i certainly do um yeah it's interesting the question remains then like why would it be blue in the first place in the absence of melanin and i don't have an answer for that maybe it's Uh, the same reason why the sky the answer well, so yeah, so so a lot of blues in nature are blue for the same reason the sky is blue. Mm-hmm. And it has to do with well, no, I think this I think the sky being blue has something to do with like absorption rather than just scattering, but that could be wrong. Um but like you know how like sometimes smoke is kind of bluish? Mm-hmm. That's the same thing as how most blues in nature are blue, is that they're actually like it's what they call structural color. And basically that means that like there's some property of the surface that's like scattering light that hits it and only letting the blue kind of bounce off basically. Mm-hmm. Whereas like molecular color or pigment as we call it, that's actually blue is apparently very difficult to make. I think it requires some weird metal or something like that. That's hard to get nutritionally. So a lot of animals don't have blue and can't produce it, but they can make a fake blue by taking advantage of that, that effect, that blue, that like scattering of the light. There's definitely some stuff on my blog about this, which makes me feel really guilty for not remembering it. Cause it's like, so, you know, it's like some fancy white guy's name, you know, like so-and-so's law, like there's some phenomenon that happens, but basically we call it structural color in the business. And like, Blue birds, blue jays, stellar's days, blah, blah, blah. Lots of blue things have that scattering of color. I think a lot of flowers too. Um, Weirdly enough, the two groups of at least birds that I know of that can produce actual blue, this is pretty relevant, this is an interesting tie back, are the cytosines, which are the parrots, and the, I forget the name of the group, but they're the taracos in Africa. And those two groups of birds both produce completely unique proteins, completely unique um, uh, uh, pigments that can produce blues and greens. Whereas like everybody else who makes blue and green color is actually kind of faking it and they're just using structural color. But like some parrots and the Taracos can make like actual blue, which is which is kind of nuts. I don't, I don't know why it's so difficult, but. Wow. There's, there's a. Yeah, biological color thing for you. <laughs> wow. Learn to me all the things right now. I love it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, what's the deal with Taracos? Taracos, the the bird family Musophagidae, which if Say I'm not mistaken, Musophagidae means banana eaters. Yeah, it does. Banana eaters <laughs> or plantain be- eaters, also known as go away birds, which is, t- I, that's an awesome name. Um, is that their call or anyway, is that they're really can, annoying? There's a um there's a very large there's a maybe a genus within that family that are called the go away birds. Uh, they're in Africa somewhere. You've probably run into them. I think they say go away or they 
mm-hmm. say something that sounds like that. that I've sense. never seen them. I probably have encountered them somewhere. Yes. Good. Good guess. Very good guess. I've been a lot of places and a lot of ecosystems across Africa, except the rainforest I, yeah. and the high desert. That's like the only two I haven't been in yet. I mean, and Ethiopia. That's high on my list. I really want to go to Ethiopia. I want to see a gelato. I just want to set foot on the Ethiopian continent, wolf. honestly. Oh, oh my good. gosh. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I <laughs> Don't tempt me like that. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> don't tempt me with a good time. <laughs> GNC's all day. Let's go. All the gin and tonics. Ah. <laughs> Let's go. Love it. Ah. I'm having trouble coming up with another color. I mean, so one array of colors that I came across recently mm-hmm. was hiking in the the blue the Blue Ridge and the Appalachian Mountains because mm-hmm. I moved to the south and now I'm exploring it and the nature down here is lit. Uh Fall in the mountains of the South is a really impressive place to witness fungal diversity. Oh, because it's so wet, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, probably other things too, but like the moisture is a big part of it. And like, my goodness, <laughs> like I don't know what I'm seeing yet. I just, I just bought a field guide to the mushrooms of Georgia from the University of Georgia pre- <laughs> Press, and I am so stoked to read it. But like, there is so much going on. I, I have gone on hikes and just like dozens and dozens and dozens of mushroom species popping That's up, crazy. From, you know, in every conceivable form. What's that? That's crazy. Like. It's amazing. And the colors, I mean, I've seen purples and blues and oranges and glow in the darks. Like there's a few species that just wah, 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 like they like really. They, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. They're bioluminescent. Yeah, yeah. Like on the scale of a firefly, but it's a fungus. Just like I need to see yeah. this. I would love to see that. Like legit. There's would, a handful I, of species that do that. it. I've only seen like the faint ones that like the mycelium Still, is glowing, but yeah, no, no, it's it's it is undeniably awesome. But I've seen like very purple ones and bluish ones and like these incredible bright oranges and I mean fungi are like not messing around. You know what I mean? They're they're amazing um, organisms and 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 the colors that they can produce, which I'm assuming they're producing them in very different ways than we are. Like, it's impressive. Um, they're really cool. That's yeah. That that is like a whole group of life that I honestly don't know much about because. I think I grew up far enough north where we have some mushrooms, but not that much. And then I lived so long in the mountains where there is no moisture. So there is like very, very rarely did I find any sort of mushrooms or fungus of any, any type. Um, I think there's a lot less out West. Yeah. It's, it's mm -hmm. hard to find. No, but that's really, really cool. I mean, I would just imagine the diversity down there alone would have to be higher. Oh, it's incredible. I, I, you know, having grown up on the East Coast, it's wet enough, you know, all the way up the East Coast that there's a lot going on. Um, but being a naturalist down in the American Southeast, in the Deep South, it's it's really been surprising. I mean, it feels like everything I grew up with turned up several notches. Like, mm. I'm used to, like, four species of frogs, and now there are, like, 30 and yeah. I'm like, oh, I'm used to like maybe one or two species of salamander. And now there are like 30. I'm like, oh, like I like this handful of of tree species. And now there's like a hundred. Like it's just, and there's like weird stuff. Like there's like, like down here in the deep south, we are like on the northern edge of like the highest up a whole bunch of weird tropical species get. Because mm-hmm. we're like subtropical. So like we get, I just recently found this out um, because a friend of mine uh, like got to like foster care for one. We have um, the furthest north uh, butterfly in the long wing family. So if you're in, I I, I guarantee you ran into long wings while you were in Brazil. Maybe you didn't know it, but like there's this family of really cool butterflies called the, ooh, Nope, not coming to me right now. Um, <laughs> the common name is the long wings. And, uh, oh gosh, Helicona Day, yes. And and they're mostly tropical. Um, but there is there is a, you know, a cousin of that family that comes all the way up here um, um, to Georgia. They're called the Gulf Fritillary. 
they're not related to other fritillaries. It's a butterfly. And they, and they are gorgeous. And they show up here. And like for the longest time, I was like, why do they look so weird? And then I, and then I started reading up on them. And like, yeah, it's a tropical species. But we're just, you know, they are the northernmost one. And we are the northernmost part of their range. And like, there it is. Um, wow. So the southeast is interesting that way. It's it's there's a lot of like you know oh, we get like armadillos for heaven's sake we get like <laughs> armadillos and black bears and possums all in the same place and you're like what's going on you know? yeah what is um, the soup that I'm living in this it, biodiversity yeah soup. it's a party down here. yeah oh the whole summer the whole summer you're just breathing pea soup yeah it, I <laughs> I don't as a New England boy I don't love the humidity oh or, I bet yeah, you well, don't oh oh this just gives me the blah thinking about it and we can't even oh, complain yeah. we're in the united states like we we whine about humidity and heat and i i've now been lots of places that are way hotter and way more humid and i'm like i can't bitch anymore i just i will but i shouldn't <laughs> because i have perspective now <laughs> that's very useful perspective uh, okay what is your last caller <laughs> one last caller oh uh, um oh my goodness it doesn't have to be a species. It doesn't have to be an animal. It could be land. It yeah, could be... that's right. That's right. Um, okay. Uh, I think it's it's a bluish color. Okay. And I'm thinking about uh, the Caribbean, mm. the the ocean, the water. Um, I used to help teach teach this field ecology course in the Bahamas uh, when I was in graduate school. And, you know, we would spend all this time on like boats going between various little islands all over the Bahamas. And so I think you're kind of still on the continental shelf, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Like everything's very shallow still. Um, but w- what was explained to me by the main ecologist on the trip was like, I, and this was so mind blowing to me. He was like, tropical oceans are a desert. There's... Like there's nothing growing in them. There are no nutrients. They're very nutrient limited. And as a result of that, the waters are super clear. And you get this, you know, incredible like turquoise, I mean, aquamarine, right, um, of the ocean. That's so much clearer than when we, when we get up up north, especially where I'm from, like Boston, like our water's not that pretty. Uh, regardless of pollution, it's just not like the Atlantic. It's just not a pretty ocean. It's I love it, but it's just not, you know. And, um, but that like super clear water that you can see so far down and stuff, the reason it's so clear is because nothing is living in it because there's no nutrients to live on. And so it's, it's funny to think about, like, I I remember like finding that a fascinating kind of paradox that like this incredibly beautiful color was due to the fact that you're in a desert and there's nothing there to eat. There's nothing, there's no nutrients there to foster life. So there are, there's no planktonic community and therefore the water is very clear um and then ironically of course that then supports one of the most productive and diverse ecosystems in the world right which are these coral reefs that because the water is so clear and the light can penetrate so deeply all these corals can live there because of course they're they're dependent on photosynthesis um so i don't know i i not only was the color i could just never forget how bright blue those colors were um but that kind of weird lesson in ecology has always stuck with me like what a, what a fascinating thing that like sometimes the desolation the, the the lack of anything available can actually lead to incredible beauty yes <laughs> that was heavy been, sorry <laughs> no that was so good no, i have not uh i've not had a chance to go to the caribbean yet and so i have not experienced those type of waters but that gave me two different it reminded me of two different bodies of water that i could say that are Mm. colorful um for very different reasons that i've experienced and i think one of them we we can't not talk about it and it is all the geyser pools in yellowstone oh yeah because they're um they're and just, ah, just if anybody's been to the Rockies and just, I guess the lack of color. And then you go across Yellowstone National Park and you see these unbelievably gorgeous geysers. And you're like, how is this even a thing? Like, how are these even here? 
I, I mean, honestly, because you, the way you were talking about that blue, there was this one, there's this one, uh, one of my favorite photos, one of my favorite landscape photos that I've, I've ever taken was of, um, I forget which geyser, uh, but it was, I think it was in like, um, like the West Thumb part. Is that like in the middle? I don't, I don't remember, but sorry. <laughs> it was like, I think no, it's no, part of good. that region. And it, and it was this. It was. It literally looked like the color of like a, a Caribbean ocean. Just how blue it was, and just to think that it was this like almost pre-life historic sulfur lava heats. I don't even know what you want to call it. Uh, that was not uh, a scientific way to describe it at all. But <laughs> just all of that. <laughs> This talk, we talk about smells and nature, man. Yellowstone mm. is not a smell good place. That's but true. that, and then in the stark contrast, when you go to these other, you know, just rich, like this this volcanic rich heat um, areas. I guess volcanic is the right isn't the right term, but just active, you know, earth active areas. Geothermal is that? Yeah, is that... That, that's the word I'm looking for. Sorry, my gin's gone. Um, geothermal <laughs> I'm, I'm is definitely help. is definitely the word I was looking for. Um, and then having <laughs> these other ones that are bright orange and like bright yellow, and all of these pools that are these different colors, um, or even like the ones that are you know like the stair step ones, and like they're green and yellow and just all of this different. I would imagine what it's probably like an algae or something that's making those colors. Like I doubt that it's maybe it's mineral deposits. I would probably have to look it up. But I bet about I think there's a bacterium involved probably. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That, that's my assumption as well. Especially the orange ones, like especially like those those orangey ones. I yeah, probably that. sulfur oxidizing bacteria. Yeah, I mean, why not? There's plenty Just of sulfur to, to go around. <laughs> yeah, uh, you can smell it. Yeah. yeah. And then similar to that, uh, if you go a little further north, if you go into like Banff National Park, I don't know if we've ever been up to Canada. No. Or any oh of my those, gosh, I've been dying to go. Yeah, or any of those northern parks with those light turquoise blue rivers. And the Ugh. gorgeous lakes like Marine Lake and all these famous lakes that you see on Instagram and all the places like they really are that beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> like it's I know right. that there's filters and stuff nowadays, but they really are that beautiful. And it's with the mineral content that's specifically in these rivers and these lakes that make it that color. And they are that turquoise. Like the first time I saw that. No, I mean, when I drove up there, so we I flew into Calgary um, and then we got a rental car. And then we drove up into like the Banff area and then I spent a whole bunch of days, you know, searching the national parks. So there's, there's actually a few national parks attached in that area. Um, this great, fantastic off the beaten path road. I found bears. I found elk. I found all of this amazing wildlife when I was up there. But one of the things that stood out the most was the water, the, the turquoise. Mm. It's I can't even the water that was flowing through town was this turquoise and i'm just like how is this real like i mean because <laughs> nowadays you don't even know online when you see photos online if that color is real like is that an actual is that is that really what that looks like it, it is it really is what it looks like it that turquoise is so gorgeous it is so pretty and it just happens to be yeah with like the mineral deposits and just the soup the natural soup that's in those waters that are making it that way. I would have to look it up um, exactly like what is the specific, you know, makeup of those waters that's making it that color. But it is, yeah, it blew me away. That blue. Yeah, so the geysers, so they're not too far away. They're not too far away considering we've talked about the globe. Um, but very different that's true. experiences. You know, yeah, the geyser pools in... Yellowstone and the beautiful colors that are produced through whatever is living in them. <laughs> I'm sure somebody has had the courage to study those very dangerous. Talk talk about a dangerous research question. What is growing in these geysers? Like, don't get eaten or like not eaten, but um, dissolved essentially in these pools. People, please don't do that. Um, and then, but you can go into the rivers and stuff in, in Canada and experience the beautiful waters. They're freezing balls, but uh, you can get 
that's okay. He won't die. Um, but yeah, so just natural things that just happen to be stunning when you see them for the first time, especially. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think my last color question is about your nail polish right now. Because was this a Halloween thing? You matched your glasses and everything. Like, what is going on over there? You <laughs> are just are, knocking it out of the park. Uh, yeah, these are my um, adult Halloween nails, a.k.a. they're purple. They're purple and black. <laughs> so, uh-huh. yeah, because I feel like... Oh, I, I, I missed the black. Okay. Oh, I mean, yeah. So they're like... So these, oh, wow. So these ones are purple, and then these ones are purple yeah. and fade to black, and then my thumbs are black. So Jeez. My sister wanted a girl's day. Man. I never get my nails done, but my sister wanted a girl's day. I'm not I'm judging. Like, yeah. I just I just oh, noticed no, as you were as you as were gesticulating, I was, I was like, oh my gosh, like there's something impressive going on there in terms of colors. <laughs> yeah, they do match my glasses perfectly, don't they? Because these are like black. I was gonna say that seems yeah, okay. I was so that wasn't that wasn't part day? of a costume. No, 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 uh-huh. no. I was talking to somebody the other day. They're like, what is your favorite color? I'm like, well, it used to be pink, but the reason why I like pink so much is because I love black. So like they they like compliment each other. <laughs> wait, wait, and, wait, 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 wait. And, and I also <laughs> love blue a lot, obviously. I love blue. I look good in blue. I have blue eyes. I love blue. And I was like, you know, I am starting to really gravitate towards purple. And I think it's because it's like the mature adult version of pink. <laughs> <laughs> But how how did you get from black to pink? How did like loving black become loving pink? I think it's because I've always lost. loved hard metal. I don't know. I've always loved rock music. And so I've I mean always... you've sent me some really good metal. I thank you for that. Yeah, you're welcome. I will if you ever I appreciate want your Spotify a feed playlist. Yeah. of good metal and metalcore, alternative metal, all those kinds of things, I will gladly as well as I, all my other yeah. music that I listen to. But I do listen to a lot of metal I, and yeah. rock. Keep it coming. Um but yeah, so when I was young, I would love, I loved wearing pink and black because I was a drummer and I love metal, but I was also still a girl. I forgot so, you were a drummer. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I know I have all these past lives that I don't really talk about on the show. <laughs> Many talents. We're going to, every episode, every episode, somehow our weird prompt for the episode will lead us to one of Brooke's amazing former lives. All yeah. nine of them. <laughs> Yeah, because you've learned uh, quite a few more of them just uh, with our conversations recently of some of the other stuff that I've done in my past. And you're like, Brooke, who are you? Essentially, like, I was like, dude, yeah. I've had a lot oh, yeah. of lives. I've had a lot of lives. Um, <laughs> and I don't I don't talk about them on the show that much because yeah. this, we'll, I'm always, we'll I'm always focused on one. my guests. I'm always focused on my guests. So I don't talk about. Of course. Lives. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's the advantage of our new of this format. Right. Is <laughs> yeah. like. This is we're gonna turn the focus on Brooke as much of as much as onto anyone else. <laughs> yeah, I just love these. That's a change of pace. Yes. Agreed. Yeah. This is a yeah. fun, fun change of pace. Well, what? Okay, so we got through like four or five of my thirteen. Does that sound about right? Yeah, I feel like we covered a lot of colors. That was non-trivial. We got yeah our way through a, a lot of a rainbow. Yeah. Wow. Look at me prepping way too much. <laughs> Look at my notes. I, I wow. Oh no. Oh, you had handwritten notes. Oh, I'm so embarrassed for you. This is terrible. Oh. Okay, everybody, for perspective, Charles and I, what we talked for an hour yesterday, how we were just going to wing this. And uh-huh. when I was sitting down thinking about this episode. <laughs> You're just gonna dig yourself this hole, Brooke? Like I, you don't have to do this. Uh, I was uh. like, okay, I will feel better if I prep because I always prep for all of my episodes. I'm always so prepped and ready to go with every single episode that I record. And I was like, I can't go. What if, <laughs> what if he asks? Him, what if I blank? Oh my god! What if I can't think of something? What's going? Uh, we hit like what? Not even fifty percent of my things. <laughs> no, but you did great. You did great. You 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 over prepared, which is, seems like your mo, and uh, you know, and the listeners will tell you what they thought. But right. you know, a, a fantastic, a fantastic new format. <sighs> awesome, Charles. Well, thank you for coming on and sitting down with thank me you. and giving me lots of laughs Always and pleasure. educating me about all the things about structural colors and some <laughs> birds that are actually that color and larches and <laughs> uh what was that um 
Oh my god, what was the butterfly? What was the oh, the long tailed skipper. Skipper. I thought stripper for a second. I'm like, it was a stripper. So what was it? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Charles save me from myself. I was like, oh, it's no. not stripper. It's not stripper. Oh, it's not stripper. What is I it? I feel like that could be its own Halloween costume <laughs> next exactly. year. Oh no. <laughs> uh thanks dude can't wait to do this again yeah likewise thank you thank you for joining me on this wild adventure today i hope you've been inspired by the incredible stories insights and knowledge shared in this episode to learn more about what you heard be sure to check out the show notes at rewildology.com if you enjoyed today's conversation and want to stay connected with the Rewildology community, hit that subscribe button and rate and review the show on your favorite podcast app. I read every comment left across the show's platforms and your feedback truly does mean the world to me. Also, please follow the show on your favorite social media app, join the Rewildology's Facebook group and sign up for the weekly Rewildology newsletter. In the newsletter, I share recent episodes, the latest conservation news, opportunities from across the field, and updates from past guests. If you're feeling inspired and would like to make a financial contribution to the show, head on over to rewildology.com and donate directly to the show through PayPal or purchase a piece of swag to show off your Rewildology love. Remember, rewilding isn't just a concept, it's a call to action. Whether it's supporting a local conservation project, reducing your own impact, or simply sharing the knowledge you've gained today, you have the power to make a difference. A big thank you to the guests that come onto the show and share their knowledge with all of us, and to all of you, Rewildology listeners, for making the show everything it is today. This is Brooke signing off. Remember, together we will rewild the planet.